Well, good afternoon, everyone. I wonder if I may bring our session to a start. I have two brief items of housekeeping first. Um, the first item is to remind speakers that we'll be meeting at 4.45 in the Erdman Centre to head out to dinner. So um, please do make your way there in good time. And the second announcement concerns our event planned for this evening. This evening, we have an event on the Göttingen Dogmatics that takes place here in Stuart Hall 6 and begins at 7.30. This is an event which has been long in the planning, which is looking forward to the publication, uh, which is to come in a, a very due season, of the complete Göttingen Dogmatics in English, representing not only a, a fresh translation of the first part of the Göttingen Dogmatics, some of you will have uh, had access to that or know of it, but also of the second part of the Göttingen Dogmatics, which was never translated. Speaking at the event this evening about the project and about the significance of those texts will be Professor Thomas Herwig, who's been the lead on the translation project and is responsible for the vast uh, majority of the work on it. Also, Professor Rinze Reling Brouwer um, of the Protestant Theological University in the Netherlands. And finally, Professor Bruce McCormack of this parish. I commend that event to you. There'll be a chance to hear from these three experts in the field as well as to have a conversation with question and answer and observation. And that event, to remind you, takes place at 7.30 p.m. here in Stuart Hall 6. That brings me to the more immediate business, which is to welcome our speaker for this final session of this afternoon, who is Thomas Joseph White. Father Thomas Joseph is the rector of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas, the Angelicum in Rome. He's the author of a variety of books, including The Incarnate Lord, a Thomistic study in Christology, The Light of Christ, an introduction to Catholicism, and most recently published just this year, The Trinity on the Nature and Mystery of the One God. He co-edits the journal Nova et Vetera. He is a distinguished scholar of the MacDonald Agape Foundation and a member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. This much, like you, if you have read the documents in your pack, I knew already before this afternoon. But it's since become known to me that Father Thomas Joseph is also a member of the Hillbilly Thomists an Americana bluegrass band composed of Dominican friars. You will find their music on Spotify, and I am reliably informed that their third album is about to drop, entitled Woolly Ghost Power. If that doesn't have you intrigued to rush to Spotify once this session is over and get that third album, I don't know what will do so. Father Thomas Joseph, in the midst of your incredibly busy schedule, we're very grateful that you're here at this conference and we look forward warmly to what you have to say. This paper may reflect my very busy schedule, negatively speaking, I hope not. Uh, I also just wanted to say that I I'm grateful to Paul for mentioning the band because I just imagine there's 10,000 people online watching this conference who are going to go out and buy the third album and all the sales go to formation for the Dominican Friars. Anyway, my, um, my talk today is entitled Karl Barth and Roman Catholicism, Sacra Doctrina and the Analogy of Being. And of course, many of the themes I'm going to explore briefly are related to my ongoing years-long conversations with uh, so many Bardians, especially Bruce McCormick, and I'm very honored to be present at this event uh, that takes place, of course, in part on his behalf and as a sign of my own ongoing theological and personal friendship with Bruce. Catholics who are inspired 
theologically by Thomas Aquinas and Protestants influenced in noteworthy ways by the work of Karl Barth do often have clear substantive disagreements theologically, to be sure. However, they don't always understand one another in the terms each other would easily recognize. This essay proceeds in two parts. I would like first to speak about the nature of theology denominated as Sacra Doctrina from a Catholic and Thomistic point of view. The aim is to explain Thomistic self-understanding regarding the practice of Catholic theology as a normative discipline and how it relates to scripture, tradition, dogma, and philosophy, as well as normative claims about orthodoxy and heresy in the Catholic tradition. Second, I'd like to talk about the famous Analogia Entis debate between Eric Chavara and Karl Barth and why I think it represents possibly a departure from classical places of Protestant Catholic debate and departure from classical places of Catholic Protestant convergence. Thomas Aquinas and Gottlieb Sungen, so I would suggest, may offer reformed theologians from the Catholic side a way forward to a more constructive and alternative grounds for conversation about the nature of Sacra Doctrina and its relationship to the analogy of being. So here's part one, Catholic Sacra Doctrina, a Thomistic presentation. As anyone recognizes, Aquinas is only one theologian among many in the Catholic tradition. Evidently, no one who is a member of the Catholic Church is required intellectually to be committed to Thomistic interpretations of commonly held doctrine let alone to Aquinas' own distinctive philosophy. What then do Catholic Thomists make methodologically of the inherent theological pluralism within their own church? And how does it relate to argumentative claims Thomists sometimes propose regarding the supposed insufficiencies of alternative theological viewpoints or the conceptual advantages of Thomistic positions in, say, Christology? Well, first, permit me then to note some levels of authority that Thomas Aquinas himself recognizes in the first question of the Summa Theologiae in the first part of the Summa, and that he returns to in the Prima Secundae in questions one and two, famous questions on the nature of faith. Now, my way of stating this Thomistic presentation of the issue of Catholic pluralism within Catholic theology is not only affected by Aquinas, but also by an interpretation of him made in light of the Second Vatican Council Dogmatic Constitution De Verbum, which is the document on divine revelation. So it's not simply, as it were, a historical critical presentation of Aquinas, but a Thomistic presentation read in harmony with that Second Vatican Council document. However, I think the harmonization of Aquinas and the Council on this point is in no way really artificial or extrinsically uh, imposed, but compatible with both documents. So what I want to do then is begin with a fourfold epistemological, uh, by naming a fourfold epistemological hierarchy of modes in which revelation is transmitted and interpreted and communicated theologically according to norms of the Catholic tradition. First, God reveals himself in free self-disclosure and self-communication by way of grace, teaching us through the medium of the prophets and apostles, and this teaching is found in scripture and in early apostolic tradition. It is received, transmitted, and understood within the living post-apostolic tradition of the church. The whole church is assisted by the Holy Spirit in this process to understand and receive the teaching of God revealed in Christ faithfully down through the ages, not without the assistance of the apostolic college, the Episcopal authorities of the church acting in communion with the See of Rome. So here I'm laying out just the first, you know, scriptural imprint as received in tradition and confirmed by the magisterium as the normative communal element, the sine qua non, as it were, of the mm, font of revelation. This teaching, secondly, this teaching is itself codified at times in dogmatic universal pronouncements, which are not identical as such with primal revelation, but which seek to promote and protect right understandings uh, of integral elements of the revelation. The dogmatic teaching of Chalcedon, for example, is not identical with scriptural revelation, but is taken to indicate something perennially true about the ontology of Christ, which is revealed implicitly in the New Testament. 
Most Catholic theologians agree that the church understands this kind of dogmatic teaching as infallibly expressive of divine revelation and therefore in some qualified sense irreformable. This does not mean that the teachings given in the locales are comprehensive or fully adequate, but they do indicate core confessional truths manifest implicitly or even explicitly in scripture that must be preserved through the ages, even if such conciliar teachings also can be reinterpreted in various ways in subsequent ages in new theological and philosophical formats. These latter theological and philosophical formats, novel though they may be in diverse ages across time, do need to preserve sufficiently the acquisitions of the church's previous claims. This includes whatever is essential to the ontological content of the classic dogmatic tradition. Of course, theologians working with the magisterium of the church try to work out over time what is essential in the ontological signification of the past teachings as they're interpreted within the horizon of new contexts. So we've passed now from, you might say, God's self-communication in scripture and tradition in and through the magisterium's place and role in the whole body of the church moved by the Holy Spirit to the fact that there are some dogmatic pronouncements that are subordinate to, but also infallibly and irreformably indicative of, but nevertheless open to new forms of scrutiny and rearticulation. Third, there are different schools of theology within the Catholic Church. Now I'm talking about schools of theology that receive the revelation and its dogmatic expressions. For example, Augustinians, the Augustinian theological tradition, the Syriac theological tradition, the Byzantine Eastern Catholic traditions, the Bonaventurian theological tradition, Thomists, Scotists, Suarezians, Ronarians, von Balthasarians, and so forth. This is not a comprehensive list. These distinct schools of thought all have a common commitment to the two levels indicated above, the scriptural and traditional and magisterial manifestation of divine revelation and its doctrinal formulations. They all guard in common those commitments. They're united within the church by this common confession of faith and come to distinct interpretations of that revelation. Now, there are significant differences of their interpretation of core truths of Christianity, and it's true also that sometimes members of one of these schools argues with the position of another school and says that it leads implicitly even to a heretical position, perhaps inadvertently. So Aquinas, who does not typically talk about people achieving heretical positions, it's very rare, he does seem to have, however, thought this about Alexander of Hales' theology as leading inadvertently towards a problematic form of Nestorianism. And I have said something like this about Karl Rahner's Christology, that it's Nestorian in tendency, and even people in the Catholic tradition who are, uh, I would say, deeply and unsympathetic to Rahner have contested whether I've gotten that charge correct right or not. Okay, so I'm also, you know, uh, guilty of doing this. More often, however, they simply accuse one another of being wrong theologically, which is not an identical charge. Neither of these forms of argumentation uh, however, whether it's saying that something leads towards an erroneous error that's deeply gray, you know, deeply problematic, or just that we think the position of another Catholic theologian is wrong, it entails as such the accusation of heresy. For heresy amounts to a willful defense of a teaching condemned by the Catholic Church or the willful denial of a proposition taught by the Church. By contrast, I take it that theological error is something that most theologians traffic in at some time, perhaps even daily, despite their best intentions and has to do with the struggle to understand the truth of revelation within diverse traditions, some of which may promote less perfect, erroneous, or deficient understandings. Of course, some also think that the various positions of major schools each have it partly right and are compatible or convergent, leading, attending to a mutual consideration of mystery, or that they're all equally inadequate. So there's plenty of uh, non-school non allegiances in Catholic theology, obviously. So all this being said, someone who affiliates for various reasons with the Thomistic tradition in the Catholic Church, who then goes on to claim that the Scotist Trinitarian theologian who refuses to think of the persons of the Trinity as subsistent relations is doctrinally outside the Catholic Church is simply not speaking reasonably. The Thomist could argue, for example, that the Scotistic view of the Trinitarian persons is problematically univocalist and therefore in some way erroneous. 
Or the Scotist can argue that the Thomist holds a view of divine persons that's incoherent. Both are arguing about the actual content of what they already agree on, that is to say, the dogmatic confession of Trinitarian faith, but they have distinct and partly incompatible accounts of that contact, of that content of the faith. And I take it, it's important to note at this juncture, that often Bardians and Thomists are doing something analogous to the quarrels between Scotists and Thomists about the content of doctrinal or dogmatic definitions, even if this is, of course, not simply identical with quarrels between Franciscans and Dominicans, since Bardians typically are not Catholic, although, of course, there are a few of them out there. Um, and um, or at least people somehow self-identify as Catholic and Bardian. Uh, and typically, of course, Bardians believe in a reformable dogmatic ecclesial claims. So now I pass my fourth level, so to speak, in the descending hierarchy of conveyance of divine revelation. Philosophy. How do distinct philosophies on a Catholic vision of things relate to these distinct schools? It's true that distinct philosophical views emerge from various theologians and their followers. Theologians generate philosophical opinions. Aquinas famously believes in a very original way that there is a real distinction and composition of essence and existence in all creatures and a non-distinction of the aforementioned in God. This was a view that Scotus and Suarez, each in distinct ways, rejected. And it has consequences, very important ones, for the theology of each of these people. Aquinas' view on this point has many implications for his theology of creation, for his understanding of the Trinity, for his conception of the hypostatic union. Henry of Ghent and Duns Scotus, meanwhile, have irrecon irreconcilable anthropological notions of the way human beings formulate concepts and make use of these distinct ideas in their reflections on the eternal. They, Scotus and um, Ghent, may have very distinct ideas in their reflections on the eternal son, by analogy, as the verbum, or eternal emanating truth word concept of God. Von Balthasar and Rahner differ deeply on the nature of human anthropology, on natural knowledge of God, and the possibility of metaphysics in a post-Kantian setting. So what should we make of all this diversity that is so deeply interrelated to diverse philosophies used within Catholic theology? First, differences among the schools, I would say, do not arise only or even primarily from their philosophies uh, that are respective, as if they were to basically differ only insofar as they had philosophical differences among themselves. Rather, they typically arise from different conceptions of the truth about the mystery of divine revelation. That is to say, difference of opinion, differences of opinion in various schools of Catholic theology typically arrive principally from diverse conceptions of the formal object of faith as such. That is to say that people have different ideas about the Trinity or the incarnation or the atonement. And these are the preceding I think logically preceding differences rather than the philosophical instruments they make use of in their effectuating of the articulation of sacra doctrina or Catholic theology. But that being said, differences among the schools definitely do arise in part due to distinct philosophical commitments. Dun Scotus and William of Ockham come to very distinct and incompatible views of the Trinity as pertains to the so-called psychological analogy, eternal processions of knowledge and loving God, in part because of the ways they understand divine simplicity as either compatible or incompatible with the notion of the psychological analogy as helping usefully to differentiate the two processions. And this is definitely related to their respective medical met metaphysical views about composition in creatures and real distinction or formal distinction as it pertains to God and the truths we can infer about God from compositions of creatures as they also obtain by analogy or even in, in a kind of univocal way in thinking about the divine essence. On this view, the one I'm suggesting, there is no point in Catholic theological history at which non-Christian philosophical ideas were taken up into the practice of theology uncritically without being discussed, vetted, reformulated, argued about, and reconsidered in light of Christ and the New Testament revelation. The use of usia metaphysics in the fourth century, for example, already entails a reformation of ambient philosophical concepts in view of the exposition of a distinctively Christian Trinitarian confession of faith at Nicaea, 
a work that I then think goes on to be effectuated in very important ways, critically, critical usia or essence metaphysics, you might say, or ontology of the divine essence of God by the Cappadocians and, and Augustine in different ways. The medieval project of trying to understand philosophical notions derived originally from Aristotle as received through Avicenna and others, and then taken up into a Christian context, the reflection on substance and relation and properties and so forth, definitely took place by overt critique of these philosophical concepts, at least in part, conducted in light of faith in Christ and the apostolic tradition, as well as the doctrinal patrimony of the church and her ongoing theological life. This was the main point of the medieval disputes, how to critique and receive constructively and how to evaluate the Aristotelian, her Aristotelian heritage in the high Middle Ages. It seems to me simply as a historical fact, impossible, impossible to make sense of the 1277 condemnations of Aristotelian theses and the way people were arguing about those if it's not all about the critical reception of pre-Christian philosophy on Christian soil. The modern Catholic use of the classical terms like essence, person, relation, and nature, uh, previously used in creedal form formulations, retains a decidedly ontological signification. I mean, there's, it's very rare to find a modern Catholic theologian who wants to completely evacuate uh, the, you might say, the, the language of the ontological uh, significations of the conciliar traditions, although you know, there are some interesting thought experiments around that that we could name of suspects we've all heard of. Uh, however, distinct schools of modern Catholic thought interpret in varied ways how these classical terms might best be preserved or translated or employed. Many modern Catholic theologians seek to preserve classical ontological significations while transposing them into modern philosophical idioms. I take as a case, for example, uh, uh, Cardinal Walter Casper, who has in his own way quite impressively sought to make uses, use of ideas from Schelling and from the Frankfurt School to articulate a commitment to classical Nicene Chalcedonian dogmatics in modern ontological idioms for his Northern European uh, um, colleagues. Rahner seeks to do something analogous in developing his own Thomistic version of transcendental anthropology. Now note three presuppositions that are present in what I've been saying that I'll try to draw more explicitly and which I are in, in this context inevitably controversial. First, Catholics can agree with Protestants at least in some ways when the latter claim that there was never any nature that does not presuppose grace or that you might say no created order has ever existed or could exist outside of the covenant of election. Philosophical reflection in the Catholic theological tradition presupposes always already an ongoing reformation of all prior philosophical notions taken up in light of Christ, but those notions themselves already exist in a world that is, you might say, governed in view of the incarnation. This is not a novel view, as any historian of patristic or medieval theology should rightly attest. Second, and simultaneously, grace does presuppose nature, there are no philosophically innocent theologians. Every theologian makes some use of philosophical and indeed metaphysical notions, whether modern or classical, even as he or she also seeks to baptize them within a theological format, as presumably Bart has tried to do, however successful he thinks one thinks he was, with Kant and Hegel, or as Schleiermacher has done in his Modern Metaphysics of Consciousness, or as Eberhard Jungel did, I think, in his own way by employing Heidegger to make sense of his theological uh, decisions. I take it that none of these thinkers operates without at least an implicit commitment to philosophical and metaphysical positions, and none can be rightly understood without some philosophical analysis, uh, analysis as such. I'm not convinced, therefore, of the epistemological possibility of a post-metaphysical theology but only of opinions among alternative metaphysical influences. Sorry, of, of, of opinions among al yeah, alternative metaphysical influences. Third, all of this need not lead to the conclusion that medieval ontology in general, or Thomism in particular, must represent the apex of faith. The idea that the older thing is better or the newer thing is always better or seem to me equally crass and misleading ideas. After all, what is best is just what is true, 
not what is earlier or later in its appearance in time, although there are old things that are often believed by many people because they have long-standing weight as attaining to the truth and new insights that we need to be very attentive to if we want to find the truth. So where does this leave us? Based on the account of Catholic theology I'm offering, there is no tradition free from the philosophically influenced reading of the New Testament or the patristic tradition. And so something like Barth's early treatment of St. Paul's ontology in his famous commentary on the Romans is influenced in part by his neo-Kantian formation, just as his later Trinitarian ontology in Church Dogmatics 4.2 does seem to contain some echoes of Hegel's logic and history of religions, some Hegeling, as he said. That does not mean that his analysis of Paul is uh, not primarily controlled by the data of the New Testament as its formal object, nor does it mean that his thinking is erroneous insofar as he makes use of some you might say, theology of interruption that is in deep uh, dialogue with or influence of neo-Kantian anthropological presuppositions or mm, reflective assimilation of those philosophical stances. It does mean, however, if I'm right, that we should treat skeptically the claim of theologians to provide us with chemically pure interpretations of scripture that are free from the taint or dependence on frameworks of reception through the medium of theological tradition that has itself assimilated philosophy, however critically or uncritically. Neither Schleiermacher's nor Barth's use of a post-Kantian ontological set of categories indicates a theological problem per se, based on all that I've mentioned above. As I've argued elsewhere, a Catholic theologian can think of Barth in particular as a helpful resource for thinking about how to express many biblical and traditional Christian claims in a distinctively modern context and idiom. So if one interprets him as successfully modern and orthodox, this does not necessarily make him better or worse than Athanasius or Thomas Aquinas. But it means we have a right and responsibility to compare all these thinkers with one another and think critically about what, to they, what we take to be the best formulations ontologically in light of sacred scripture and tradition and the common doctrine of the church, such as the Council of Chalcedon, as well as what we think are the sound philosophical practices assimilated to theological uses. This being said, we should, I believe, treat the acquisitions of the great tradition as having a greater weight than um, loan or experimental innovations, however brilliant, if only because the popularity of the common doctors suggests by their widespread acceptance and use the possibility of a greater accord with the census fide, the common faith of all the baptized. Augustine is a reference through the ages, to take an example, in part because he helps us get to the church's common thinking regarding the truths of divine revelation, and he does so by making constructive use of the ambient pre-Christian philosophical heritage, you might say taken captive, as every thought must be for Christ. The same could be said of many notable theological doctors of the past, and this means that newer ideas should, as John Henry Newman said, be subject to assessment by association with the various references to the tradition in those instances where the latter seems to display chronic vigor across time. There is admittedly an outstanding difference between Barth and the Catholic tradition on at least one point, or this point in particular, whether the Christian critique and reform reformation of all non-Christian forms of ontology may give rise to a distinctive philosophy on Christian soil or a Christian philosophy that is fully assimilated to and compatible with the scriptural deposit of faith and the dogmatic tradition, but susceptible in principle to extraction for the purposes of teaching philosophy or metaphysics as a distinct field of revelation of reflection. That is to say, after Christ and in his light, is it possible for there to be a philosophical ontology as such? Or concretely speaking, can one teach a class of philosophy in a seminary that offers metaphysical analysis of what a living thing is, or a human person, or philosophical arguments for the existence of God, and so forth? Here, Catholic theologians most typically hold that such philosophical instances of, you might say, post-Christian critical thought are possible and even salutary, especially given the effects of sin, original, personal, and collective, 
on human intellectual endeavors outside of grace. Due to the effects of sin and the need for grace, non-Christians may be unlikely to interest themselves in or accept such a Christian philosophy. But if grace presupposes and must heal and rehabilitate nature in the light of Christ, then some form formation in philosophy could be necessary, especially on Christian soil. Relatedly, the Catholic Church famously teaches that there are preambula fide, that's to say, philosophical and moral truths accessible to reason in principle, but difficult to attain to in our fallen state. Truths that the church teaches for that reason uh, in a formal way, you might say, in her doctrinal patrimony, but that she also claims are, strictly speaking, philosophical and such, even if rarely attained outside of the domains of divine revelation. She also teaches that there are reasons of credibility derived from signs of the truth of revelation in things like ongoing miracles or the moral witness of the saints that designate obliquely the truth of the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, to human reason in extrinsic ways that do not provide the grace of faith as such, but do show its seeming rationality or non-irrationality, to put it in the most gentle form. So this last point does remain an outstanding topic of division, but how important is this final topic of division I've just noted? Regarding that question, I'll turn to my second and slightly shorter section of the paper, the Analogia Entis and Ecumenical Theology. Clearly, the engagement between Chavara and Bart in the early 1930s was an occasion of elevated ecumenical encounter, and it gave rise to subsequent conversations of great importance not least in virtue of von Balthasar's momentous work, The Theology of Karl Barth, as well as in many other uh, noteworthy instances. Nevertheless, we should ask ourselves whether either Chavara or Barth rightly identified the theological essential differences between Protestantism and Catholicism. It's at least a fair question. Is Barth correct to say, for example, in Church Dogmatics 1.1, that the use of the Analogia Intis presents us with the central reason one should not be a Catholic, seemingly turning this against the, uh, as he called the modernist Protestant uh, interlocutors who he thought held to a version of it, and therefore, unlike him, didn't have a good reason not to be Catholic. Nevertheless, it's a theoretically strong claim. I'd like to suggest two perhaps intellectual improprieties that I think were made in this initial debate between Chavara and Bart and refer to a famous intervention on the part of Gottlieb Sung and that I think acts as a remedy. The first intellectual impropriety, as I see it, and perhaps the most consequential, stems from Eric Chavara, who famously claimed that the analogia entis is, quote, the fundamental form of Catholic theology. Now, when most Catholics speak, admittedly somewhat vaguely and confusedly, of an analogia intus, they typically refer to the human ability to know something of God by way of natural philosophical reflection. And incidentally, this is how I almost always use the term personally as well when I'm not trying to contextualize it. However, Chavara does not mean to signify this alone, as John Betts has repeatedly and rightly pointed out. Importantly, Chavara's definition of the analogia intus does include philosophical knowledge of God by way of metaphysical reflection and analogical discourse. However, this form of knowledge is itself for Chavara taken up into a larger Catholic thought form denoted under the term and rubric analogia intus that includes properly theological reflection on the mystery of the Trinity and Christ, as well as the Virgin Mary, the church and the sacraments. In fact, I think what he's referring to, I mean, his prose is famously, you know, dense. In fact, he's referring to ontological similitudes between the Trinity and creatures that emerge in a variety of instances and cross a spectrum of examples in the nature of creation as known philosophically, but also in creation as known in light of the explicit revelation of the Trinity and in the rhythm of creation, you might say unfolding dynamically and ontologically in the economy of salvation. Um, in a history in which human beings receive grace, cooperate with grace, and in which the incarnation occurs such that God takes on a human nature and there are two distinct natures in Christ that are, you might say, uh, a, a, a symphonically allied, and that this is then effectuated in the life of the church. Uh, this, there's then an effect in the life of the church such that in the fiat to grace of the Virgin Mary, initially in the incarnation and then in the larger life of the church, the Holy Spirit 
coordinates the activities of Christians in the creation with the living work of God revealed in Christ. Now, undergirding all this is in a certain way, you might say, a philosophical anticipation of the possibility of rhythmic coordination between God and humanity that's indicated obliquely and uh, initially in the philosophical metaphysics of creation. What's significant for our purposes is that Chavara claimed that the study of this structure and economic rhythm of ontological similitude that is evinced both in the orders of nature and grace, and that's known both theologically and philosophically, this analogy of being, is the essence of Catholic theology, the fundamental form. Form means essence. In his mind, it has to. He's a scholastic. If I understand him rightly, this means that the essence or formal object of Catholic thought is the study of the similitudes between the Trinity, between the Trinity and creatures making use of a sound metaphysics. He contrasts this in turn which, with what he takes to be essential to Protestantism, a distrust of human mediations, behind which Chavara posits a latent oppositional mode of thinking between God as sovereign agent and the human act agency of persons their natural powers even under grace, their cooperation in the order of sanctification and so forth, all conceived under a dialectical and extrinsic mode. One suggests he is, one suspects he is suggesting that there's an implicit meta-ontology that lies behind the doctrine of justification in Luther's early theology, which is reflected in the subsequent Lutheran and Reformed refusal of various facets of the Catholic tradition such as instances of authoritative doctrinal clarification, where the magisterium cooperates infallibly with God, Mariology, where a human nature is redeemed so deeply as to be perfectly conformed to God under grace, theories of instrumental sacramental theology, where you can rely on the ex opere operato, coordination of the human activity of sacramental ministry and the communication of grace, and so forth. Chivara almost certainly sees this meta-ontology as coming to light or being evidenced in Barth's own characteristically Protestant form of thought. In other words, Chivara is agreeing in a way with the idea of Barth that Barth has hit rightly upon the essence of what it is to be Protestant, uncovering a meta-ontology, you might say, there from the beginning, and that in this way, Barth is more perfectly reformed than even ever Luther or Calvin was, or we might experiment with that thought. And I think Sungen, in his own way, goes in this direction as well in his characterizations, characterizations of Bart. And interestingly, von Balthasar does not. He sees Bart as a kind of crypto-Catholic, which is a very interesting intra-Catholic debate about what Bart is. Chavara's ideas are interesting and perfectly appropriate to explore within the context of a robust ecumenical conversation. But I think he, in fact, misled Bart by his characterization of the fundamental form or essence of Catholic theology. Let's, us, let's return briefly to our consideration of Sacra Doctrina from the first part of this essay. What's the formal object of Catholic theology? Well, actually, medieval theologians thought about that great, a great deal and expended great effort arguing about the topic with different theories, some saying Christ, the word made human, the incarnation is the fundamental object of Catholic theology. Others said the church, her life and her sacraments. Aquinas' view is that the proper object of theology is God, the Holy Trinity who has revealed himself in Christ. The fundamental form or essence of theology, then, is the study of God, the Holy Trinity, revealed in Christ. Aquinas then stipulates that one must understand all things in light of the Trinity, which is why the nicene Constantinopolitan Creed functions as a reference for core principles, as it allows us to read scripture correctly in a Trinitarian light and to interpret the scriptural revelation in a Trinitarian perspective. Now, what none of the medievals or anyone before or since Eric Chavara has ever claimed is that the formal object of theology is the study of the rhythmic ontological similitudes between God and his creation, evidenced in both philosophy and theology. It's just never been said by anybody before him or after him. The idea is certainly worthy of consideration. It's not even a ridiculous suggestion. On the contrary, it's a very deep one, and it has some potential connections to Aquinas. You could imagine, as it were, a Chavarian school had more people caught on, or if they eventually do catch on. But just note the difference between this view and the one I've been expounding. In Aquinas, it's clear that theology looks first and foremost at the Trinity and interprets the world in light of the ultimate truth revealed in Scripture, making some measured use of philosophical ontology within theology. But Chavara seems to invert the order of procession 
The philosophical study of the analogy of being, which has roots in Greek philosophy, anticipates a rhythm of being we will discover again at a higher level in the domain of revealed truths about Trinitarian ontology. Now, it may be possible to defend this claim from a Thomistic point of view, but what Chavara does do, in effect, is give us the impression that if we begin with the right metaphysics, we will eventually reach the right theology. The study of philosophical ontology inaugurates the engagement with revelation itself, even entering pedagogically into the definition of the form of theology. Well, that's not a view I want to espouse. Barth's reaction is equally nebulous and disputable to my mind. It seems clear enough that the classical disputes stemming from the Reformation era are about mediation. Is there an Episcopal structure stemming from apostolic times that is an essential part of the constitution of the church? Are there seven sacraments or only two? And what is a sacrament? In what sense is it a sign, an instrument of grace, or is it? Can church councils be said to formulate irreformable, infallible doctrines that are free from error and that mediate the truth of revelation? And in what sense is it true to say that the church could preserve infallible teaching? Are the Virgin Mary and the canonized saints exemplars of the life of grace, whose actions under cooperative grace manifest the saving power of Christ's action in the world? Or is this all a Catholic superstructure an, exten an extensive, uh, sorry, an extrinsic scaffolding obscuring the true face of Christ. The Reformation solas regarding scripture, justification by faith alone and grace alone, meaning God acting prior to and above human cooperation, all work to assure a more restricted view of mediation, presumably as a form of mm, purification and rectification in view of a greater manifestation of the glory of God alone and the centrality of Christ as the unique mediator of salvation. Many classical Lutheran Reformed and Anglican divines reserve a place for the measured use of philosophy within dogmatics, including philosophical arguments as such for the existence of God and the determination of what we might say or not say about his attributes. Bart presented the rather novel claim, or at least in some sense, ex ex emphasis, the emphasis was a bit novel, in Church Dogmatics 1.1, that the core differences between Catholic and Protestant theology stem from the Analogia Intis, initially interpreted largely as natural theology, but that which then creeps into the fa every facet of Catholic theology. Now, historically speaking, this seems to me a very novel claim, and it may be defensible, especially if one thinks that Chavara's account of, the sac of Sacra Doctrina as the fundamental form of theology in the Catholic tradition is correct. However, Chavara's claim amounts to nothing more than a very brilliant and um, original thought experiment, one held by virtu virtually no one before him or since. But Bart takes it to be as insightful and uh, takes it as insightful and constructs a counter reaction which is somewhat similar in content but distinct in method. So whereas Chavara took Bart precisely in his ontology to be the exemplary Protestant, mistakenly, I suspect, Bart also takes Chavara in his definition of theology to be the exemplar, exemplary Catholic, which I take to be a theoretical, uh, regrettable perspective. These two approaches are distinct in method because the fundamental core of Reformed theology, according to Bart, is determined by knowledge of God procured only by revelation and only by the consistent unilateral activity of the Holy Spirit in freedom without any theoretically uh, autonomous constructive contribution from philosophy. We should note the dialectical reaction here if Chavara suggested that philosophical metaphysics set the tone for Catholic theology as a kind of initiation to its essence, uh, Bart reacts by denying any role to specifically philosophical or metaphysical knowledge of God as such, even within Sacra Doctrina, as subordinate. Neither of these positions seems to self-consciously reflect on and engage with that of a figure like Aquinas, who thinks that theology studies God, the Holy Trinity, and can make use of philosophy as a, sub a subordinate science, distinct, uh, but set in the service of theology. Many Reformed theologians, especially in the Protestant scholastic traditions, have a similar view, and arguably there's a good bit of harmony here between Aquinas and 
and other figures in the Reformed tradition. I would myself say Aquinas and Calvin, but I mean, in this context, I don't want to, you know, hazard an opinion on that in front of so many experts. I just, I, I don't think Calvin and Bart agree on these matters, but I mean, you know, who am I? Okay. However, this potential congruence between the Reformed tradition and Aquinas now all seems to be obscured. What the Reformation is about, we are told after this famous chavara bart debate, is a new Bardian idea of unilateral divine activity without human agency, allied with an idea about the absence of any natural knowledge of God in the human community. And so now, one can only gain access to the classical reform solas if we also acknowledge this new Bardian epistemological condition of the possibility of reformed theology. Is this correct, however, simply as a reading of the Protestant tradition? I leave to others more qualified than me to determine. It's certainly a powerful and intriguing suggestion. However, I wonder if it falls into the same category within the Protestant community that Chavara's thought falls into within the Catholic community. That's to say it's a powerful, deeply original proposition with the difference that in Bart's case, it's been far more influential among Protestants than Chavara's idea has been among Catholics. So Bart proposes, for example, in Church Dogmatics 1.1 that uh, there's a problem with the analogia intus, and then this does unfold in interesting ways as he aspires to articulate a wider Christological ontology of election, covenant, and creation in 2.2, 2, 3, 1, and 2, 4, 1, and 2. And here he does, uh, interestingly, assimilate and reformulate all kinds of philosophical notions from modernity in a creative and innovative way, ideas from Hegel, Kant, and Sartre, among others. So one could believe that these constructive proposals are somehow logically dependent upon or conceptually intimately related to the ideas articulated at the start regarding the rejection of philosophical metaphysics. And yet we also see there's a lot of, you might say, modern ontology being integrated, reformulated, rethought on dogmatic, uh, in dogmatic terms which looks to me, at least in some way, fairly compatible with some of the things Aquinas does in a different context and different philosophical idiom. Um, and this means then that Bardians typically think that if you're committed to the later ideas, uh, you're committed to the former idea of the rejection of Catholic theology in Chavarian terms, but they don't necessarily see that some of the things Bart's doing may look a lot like some of the things done by uh, medieval and other classical figures who made use of philosophy very freely within theology. Um, the person who saw things, I think, um, differently, and who I think we ought to, I'm concluding, the thing we ought, to, a person who we ought to interject into this debate is Gottlieb Songen. Songen's essays on the controversy famously influenced Bart, who indicated in a somewhat nebulous way that if Songen's view of the analogia intus was correct, then he had little or no difficulty with the doctrine. I'm not sure the ironicism is that strong in Bart, but I think it, it is. And it, it, if I'm right, I think it's probably actually overly pronounced on his part, because I think his view in Songen's remains somewhat irreducible to one another. Some take Songen's views to be a kind of Catholic reformulation of the idea of natural knowledge of God made in concession to Bart's theology, one that anticipates the later theories of the First Vatican Council offered by Hans Urs von Balthasar in his book on Bart, where natural theology could exist in principle, but in a fallen world it basically never does, or very rarely could. Um, or maybe in a very qualified sense, it appears as a kind of, you might say, the transcendental facets of the mystery of Christ in the theodrama, the theologic, theological aesthetics, the goodness, beauty, and truth of Christ. However, Songen is well-versed in modern scholastic theology, and his analysis of the debate is based, as I see it, on the kinds of points that I've been alluding to above. Uh, Catholic theology studies the object of revelation, God himself, and in doing so seeks to unfold the analogia fidei as understood in Catholic thought, which is what? It's the likeness or resemblance found between the mysteries, the nexus mysteriorum, in which we perceive, you might say, the wisdom and goodness of God evinced in revealed mysteries that have likenesses to one another, likenesses only known by the grace of faith. Theology can do this by making use of philosophical knowledge of God or creatures, placing it in subordinate service to genuine theological reflection. The latter process presupposes the subordination, 
that the philosophical ideas of human culture, including evolving Christian intellectual culture, be analyzed and reformulated in light of divine revelation, and ultimately in view of a Christological center of theological reflection on scripture. The church's tradition and way of reading scripture provide normative points of reference for the understanding of scripture as a unified text and as a text understood in a unified, coherent way down through time in the development of church doctrine. Songen was critical of the Chavarian definition of theology, and rightly so. And von Balthasar, interestingly, follows Songen to the letter in his adjudication of this question, as did, of course, the most famous doctoral student of Gottlieb Songen, Joseph Ratzinger. Effectively, Songen points uh, out four kinds of coherence that come into play in Catholic theology, three pertaining to the Analogia Fide, and then its correlation with the Analogia Intus as the fourth. The first three being the coherence of the Old and New Testament read in, you might say, harmony or polyphony with one another as a unified revelation. The second being the coherence of the mysteries of faith themselves revealed in the Old and New Testament, the way the mystery of the Trinity, the incarnation, the church, Israel, the Virgin Mary, the sacraments, all are in some way tied to each other in a divine coherent logic traced by theology. Third, the coherence of the church's teachings across time through tradition based on scripture and apostolic tradition. That also has to be assured by the Catholic Analogia Fide. Now, the coherence of these first three with natural knowledge of God, oh, sorry, the, the coherence of these first three with natural knowledge of the world as illumined and aided by the former, that's to say, as natural reason is illumined by the grace of faith, constitutes the fourth coherence, the coherence of the analogia fide with the so called analogia intus. The first three of these forms of coherence are what he indicates under this 19th century Catholic terminological heading of analogia fide. The fourth is that coherence of the analogia fide with the analogia intus. He, he says sometimes the, the divinely revealed book reveals the book of nature. That's a far cry from the vision of Chavara, and it sounds to me fairly convergent with the vision of Thomas Aquinas. In the first section of this essay, I've argued that a Thomistic understanding of sacred doctrina, rightly understood, has a place for contributions from philosophical ontology, critically assimilated in light of divine revelation. In this second part of the essay, I've argued or suggested that this conception of the use of philosophy within sacred doctrina ought not to be considered church dividing. Chavara and Bart together have bequeathed us a legacy of thinking that it must be. However, I would dare say that this legacy is something of a poisoned chalice, one that Protestants and Catholics should refuse to drink from together. The terms of disagreement and disagreement should be reevaluated, including in Christological conversation. Ecclesia simper reformanda est. Of course, I'm not suggesting that Catholics and Protestants have no significant theological divisions among them, but only that these need not and should not be framed in terms of the analogia intus debate. Catholics and Protestants can and should argue about the truth or falsehood of diverse Christological ontologies and about the value of various philosophical ontologies, whether classical or modern. But those arguments need not be church dividing. Referring back to my hierarchical degrees from the first section of the essay, one can, one can agree on Chalcedonian principles in Christology while belonging to distinct schools of thought that in turn harness concepts from diverse philosophical traditions. There are arguments worth having between the schools, but they are not arguments about the truth of the common creedal confession of faith per se. We can find common convergent ways to confess the one Christ, the Son of God, truly God and truly human. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Father Thomas Tui, uh, for your paper. The floor is now open. If you have any questions, comments, responses. Hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Thank you for uh, this paper. It uh, 
help me understand uh, the common ground between uh, Bruce McCormack and uh, yourself more clearly than uh, the book you edited together um, did or could. <laughs> so it was um, illuminating in some sense. And um, because you're a Thomist, I have a question about uh, Thomas <laughs> and uh, the possibility of uh, uh, natural knowledge of God. He, uh, I mean, in <clears throat> the way he uses uh, ph philosophy, the on on ontology, right, philosophical path to God, um, which uh, stops or reaches ultimately uh, the concept of esse, uh, God as esse, or actus essendi, or uh, this being <clears throat> who uh, doesn't have. Uh, other um, or whose essence is uh, his be. act of being, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> uh, pure uh, simplicity, because uh, there is no essence other than his uh, own existence. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> uh, it's difficult to uh, ask about Thomas. I'm with you, but though. Thomas, I'm, I'm with you. Like you, <laughs> but uh, so uh, philosophy stops there, and uh, Thomas says that. Um, we cannot uh, intellectually, our mind cannot understand uh, pure being, this essay, this, because uh, we, we are not simple and we, as you said, um, uh, empirically all we know is uh, our beings uh, where essence and existence or this act of being, our act of being is not ours. <laughs> so it's not, they're not uh, one in us. So the idea of uh, pure being, of uh, this, this essay, uh, which uh, remains a little bit uh, <laughs> conceptually uh, even uh, very difficult to uh, describe, I mean, uh, even for Thomas, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, in, it's in somehow intellectually out of grasp. So uh, we, we cannot conceive such a being, even though, I mean, our mind stops here, but uh, what we found is not really graspable. By our mind. <clears throat> so, given that, if I understood Thomas correctly, uh, is there any natural knowledge of God? If mm -hmm. philosophy, is, if he says philosophy stops here and uh, stops where, <laughs> not giving us, uh, right. yeah, uh, uh, any, uh, I mean, not not being able to give us an idea of what this being is. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's a totally clear question to me. I, uh, this is a, there's famous debates about this among Thomists. Um, let me just say a few brief general things. Okay, first of all, it's very clear that what Aquinas is doing when he argues philosophically, as he does demonstrably in his mind, using syllogisms he thinks are actually demonstrative for what we all call God in the five ways, but in many other places, because there's about 15 arguments for existence of God in Aquinas. Um, he is not doing something that we would call like 18th or 19th century uh, British natural theology or uh, Enlightenment natural theology. It doesn't mean there's no commonalities, but it is important as we put everything in historical context to realize that the way these people were thinking in the Middle Ages was very different. And the way that then they generate names for God, as he calls it, or attributes as it's sometimes called, Though he takes some, you know, has concerns about calling the thing God says attributes, the names for God, that that itself is a very different kind of project than what we might call modern post-enlightenment natural theology. Uh, the second thing I'd say is uh, when he talks about divine simplicity, uh, there are many theories of divine simplicity in the high Middle Ages. I mean, that's something I discovered recently and I'm fascinated by, that there's radical differences between, say, Richard St. Victor Scotus, Aquinas, and Occam on divine simplicity, and you could add more characters, and there's huge consequences to it. But they are all confessing divine simplicity in part because they're Trinitarian, so they have a theological motivation. They want to argue that the divine essence common to the three persons is uh, the three divine, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not three persons the way three human persons are three different individuals who share one essence but are actually three substances, three different individual beings, but rather the Trinity is mysteriously, ineffably transcendent of that kind of composition. So the Trinity is somehow simple, and the essence that's common to the three is the individual divine essence, 
So God is totally unlike anything we know in this world. This is a theological apophaticism at the heart of the Fourth Lateran Council and in the High Medieval Reflection that is um, theologically generated. That being said, Aquinas does uh, really make philosophical arguments for the existence of God and um, uh, and for the divine simplicity based on the composition of essence and existence, it's non-distinction in God, which is really unique to him in the way he formulates it. Now, some Thomists like David Burrell or before him Herbert McCabe, who were in influenced by uh, Wittgenstein one, and your man, Victor Preller, you know, argue that basically this is a kind of grammar of apophaticism. And that's a wing of Thomistic uh, analysis that... Um, is a kind of Wittgensteinian reading of Aquinas, which has a certain respectable pedigree, but is definitely not mainstream. Um, and then there's those who think there are demonstrations, but the demonstrations basically, as Aquinas say, terminate in the, uh, the, the uh, affirmation that there must be a transcendent source of all that is, but we don't know it. Essentially, it's mysterious and, un and sort of incomprehensible. But this is showing, you might say, reason using employing reason to show the possibility after the fact of divine revelation as gift. So it augments after receiving the grace of the knowledge of the Trinity, the heightened sense of the gratitude for the grace because it's nature, you might say under grace, discerning its own limitations apophatically in the face of the Trinitarian revelation. And I think that's a very defensible reading of Aquinas. I think he's doing something stronger than that. But I think that reading, which is not so unlike things you find in the Lutheran tradition is like, you know, textually somewhat defensible. I think he's doing something a bit more strong in the sense that I think he thinks that talking about the divine attributes, after you get simplicity and perfection, it's going to generate a language of transcendence that's going to have important consequences for treatment of Catholic doctrines like creation, which is clearly not a philosophical idea per se, you know, and, and also divine uh, Trinitarian relations of, uh, yes. and personhood. So I, I do actually think, I paradoxically say, he's doing more philosophically than you intimate, but he's doing it precisely because he's got more work to do theologically with those concepts on Christian soil. But that's a Thomistic inside baseball reading. And if we had a group of Thomists here, which thank God we don't, they would all start arguing with me right now, the way you argue with each other. We're going to take a question online, which for reasons of time, I'm afraid, may have to be our last question. The question is a clarifying question. Would you identify Thomas' interaction with Aristotle as formally equivalent to Bart's use of Kantian or Hegelian categories? What, if any, distinctions would you draw between these two uses of philosophy and theology? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I don't know that what they mean by formally equivalent, what Glenn means by formally equivalent, because I mean essentially equivalent when I think of that. But no, they're definitely not equivalent. I mean, one of the things I'm suggesting is that Aquinas is more methodologically self-transparent. I mean, I obviously believe that. I think Aquinas is more, he, he, I don't think he practices as much. I, I think Bart, you know, does things he says he shouldn't be doing, but that's okay to me because the things he actually does are often really good and cool and like they you get good results that Catholics can agree with. But I, I think there's some uh, in practice use of philosophical notions um, with less, I would call it, theolo with less innocence than he himself ascribes to, to his, the purity of his practice. I think he's more compromised, soiled by philosophical usages. Um, but that's okay because he has a human nature, and I think nature is getting redeemed by grace, he, you know, in these instances as well. But, but the other thing is that, and this is also, this is something maybe more significant and less mischievous. Um, he, obviously, if you're using Kant, uh, as your theological dance partner, you're going to go places you don't if you use Aristotle and Augustine and uh, Avicenna and so forth. And so um, you're going to, I mean, this was alluded to in the, the talk uh, the, uh, this morning about Calvin and, and Aquinas. I mean, you're going to use this sort of, you might say, skeptic, skeptical regimen that's in um, the philosophy of Kant to good effect to humble the human intellect and to make it aware of its need or capacity to be in a stance of receptivity. Um, so I, I know that he has theological motivations at every point in justifications, articulations for using Kant, but I also think it's a modern, it happens to be a very popular modern philosophy at the time he's writing that many people uh, hold to in common culture. And here I'm like winking at Schleiermacher, 
the culture despisers are Kantians. And, you know, if you use him as a dance partner, you're going to have a very different set of uh, understanding of the relationship between nature and grace and a, a different and perhaps better modern hearing in your cultural context. Friends, I'm afraid we've gone over our lot of time. Can I ask the speakers who are going up dinner, we're going to leave from here instead of from her. So immediately after the session, over, we'll make tracks. But for now, can I ask you to join if we can thank him, Father Tom. I'm not, I don't know that I've, have I ever met him in person. I, no. I know a lot about him because of mutual friends and his teaching and his writing. Yes, well, I studied, he was my mentor. Yeah. 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 Yeah.